This is a horseshoe crab. It's not the prettiest animal, and most people that tend to cross a path with one tend to either freak out its appearance, claim that it's an alien creature, or simply move on with their lives not really thinking much else of it. But this underappreciated little guy is actually a hero in the medical community, and he's benefited nearly all of our lives, so why not learn about him a little bit? My name is George, and immediately following the completion of my Bachelor of Science degree at Ryder University, I found an incredible opportunity to spend a summer working up close and personal with a wide range of marine animals at the Aquarium of Niagara, right up in Niagara Falls. As an aquarium educator, when I wasn't giving educational talks on the differences between seals and sea lions, or monitoring the water quality of exhibits through colorimetric analyses, I was actually found most often out on the road driving to different schools and summer camps of various towns in western New York with my traveling touch tank of marine invertebrates in hand. And this educational aquarium outreach program allowed us to give kids up close encounters with different mollusks and urchins and crabs, observing their traits and exploring the themes of their evolution and biodiversity. Now granted, these animals are not nearly as flashy as the bigger, cuter mammals and penguins, but I can assure you that each of these animals has its own really awesome characteristics that can help us better understand marine ecosystems and even improve our own livelihood, including my very favorite animal of the touch tank, which without contest is no doubt Limulus polyphemus, aka the Atlantic horseshoe crab. Now, despite the slightly similar morphological appearance seen from a bird's eye view, the horseshoe crab is definitely not a stingray. Stingrays don't have legs, Horseshoe crabs do. It may also be worth noting that a horseshoe crab's tail cannot actually sting you. In reality, it's not used as a weapon of any kind. Its true sole function is to give the critter a little bit of leverage to prop himself upright if he were to ever get flipped upside down, which when walking around the ocean can actually happen kind of a lot. What's particularly interesting is that not only is the horseshoe crab not a stingray, horseshoe crab is also not a crab. At the molecular level of shared DNA sequences, the animal actually bears more recent common ancestors with scorpions and spiders than it does with crabs. So this begs the question, why would an animal so closely related to arachnids most of us go out of our way to avoid make such regular appearances in aquarium touch pools for children to interact with up close? Well, for one thing, if you've ever had a vaccination or any IV treatment for that matter, your very life itself may actually be indebted to these animals. And that's no small statement to overlook. Horseshoe crabs have for decades now been single-handedly responsible for keeping millions of lives safe from exposure to dangerous, sometimes even fatal levels of bacterial endotoxins. How, you may ask? Well, you see, this underappreciated animal holds a secret in its blood supply. If you've never found yourself in a position of seeing horseshoe crab blood before, you might be surprised to see that it's actually bright blue in color. There's a very logical explanation for all this. Quick, tell me. Well, before anyone jumps in with any quips about blue blood being deoxygenated, I'll assure you that all of the blood in your body is red. Even the blood we call deoxygenated, as it still has trace levels of oxygen and appears very dull, almost blackish red in color. Anyway, the real reason that horseshoe crab blood is blue as it oozes out from their bodies is actually a result of their blood supply containing copper-composed hemocyanin that binds oxygen rather than the iron-composed hemoglobin that we have. But to reroute us back to the bigger picture, what about this blue blood is saving us from that untimely bacterial death? I wish I knew what we were looking for. We'll know when we find it. Yeah. Well, let's set the scene. If we jump back for a second to the early 1940s, in the middle of World War II, Major illnesses and deaths occurring in soldiers out in combat due to bacterial infections of open wounds led to the mass implementation of the first major antibiotic, penicillin. First discovered by pharmacologist Alexander Fleming in 1928 as he watched the effects of a growing a mold, Penicillium notatum, on a Staphylococcus culture plate, the drug wasn't actually utilized on its first human patient until 1941, when Albert Alexander, a constable of the county of Oxford, England, was felled by a rose thorn to the face. Unfortunately for Alexander, he wasn't treated for nearly a month after his initial infection and ultimately died, but his clinical trial was the first observation of penicillin slowing disease progression. 
Ultimately, the drug worked through a beta-lactam ring in its molecular structure that had a shape just right to bind the active site of DD transpeptidase, a bacterial enzyme that cross-links the side chains of peptidoglycan strands, which are just long polymers of sugars and amino acids. This process makes a strong, intact peptidoglycan mesh in the bacterial cell wall, but by binding the active site, this beta-lactam antibiotic could prevent the enzyme from building this protective mesh, which would ultimately weaken the cell wall and cause the cell to burst like a compromised dam due to osmotic pressure. But while this drug was extremely potent against a broad spectrum of bacteria, there were still infections where the same drug treatment seemed significantly less effective. Why? Well, going all the way back to 1884, a Danish bacteriologist, Hans Christian Gram, was working on developing a stain to make bacteria more visible in samples of lung tissue. What actually ended up being discovered with this staining methodology was that the bacteria could actually be differentiated into two major groups with this stain based on the properties of their cell walls. Bacteria susceptible to the penicillin drug like Staphylococcus and Streptococcus were labeled as gram-positive because their peptidoglycan meshes made up about 40 to 80% of the cell wall and stained violet or purple under gram staining method. However, the other major group of bacteria, the gram-negative group, did not retain the violet peptidoglycan stain because it turns out that this group has only a very thin peptidoglycan layer comprising about 5% of the cell wall, and this thin layer is actually covered by an outer cell membrane layer, reducing the capacity for the dye to even reach the thin mesh. So instead, these gram-negative bacteria appear pink or red when counterstained with alternative dyes. That outer membrane acts as a barrier protecting the transpeptidase enzymes of gram-negative bacteria from inactivation by the beta-lactam antibiotics, making it harder to stop their growth in an infection site, and things quickly go from bad to deadly because these gram-negative bacteria have lipopolysaccharides within their outer membranes that, when introduced intravenously to us, triggers the release of inflammatory cytokines by our macrophages, which can result in excess inflammation leading to organ failure and death. So. Being able to detect these endotoxins is essential to making sure we aren't dropping dead from getting accidentally shot up with bacteria endotoxins in our yearly flu shots. And how do we do it? Horseshoe crab blood. Horseshoe crab blood is made up of special cells called amoebocytes that upon contact with LPS endotoxins undergo a cascade of biological reactions, leading to the secretion of coagulogen, a protein that can be converted to a solid gel-like substance in the blood causing coagulation and immobilizing the invading bacteria. In vivo, this allows for the horseshoe crab to immobilize any bacteria entering its body through any cuts. But by the 1970s, scientists learned that they were able to obtain the aqueous extract of the amoebocyte cells by bleeding up to 30% of a horseshoe crab's blood volume and then releasing the animal back to the wild. And this blood is not cheap stuff. One single quart, in fact, can be valued as much as $15,000. And the steep price comes from its very valuable purpose. After all, this extract, known scientifically as Limulus amoebocyte lysate, or LAL, is used for the safety assessment of medical equipment, and if any endotoxin is present in a sample, the gel coagulation can be observed in an increase in sample turbidity, letting doctors know that the equipment cannot be used. Now, this is where I was prepared to stop and reflect on how we can all now show a greater appreciation for this animal, but hang on. This LAL testing procedure based upon the collection and bleeding of horseshoe crabs has been in practice since the 1970s. In the four decades of scientific advancements being made since then, we haven't found any better system of endotoxin testing that can spare the horseshoe crab blood harvest entirely. Well, the switch away from bleeding horseshoe crabs is actually coming in large part due to advancements in genetic engineering technologies. Scientists have identified a horseshoe crab blood enzyme they labeled as factor C, so it would be the principal reaction in the cascade of coagulation activation triggered by LPS endotoxins. And scientists have been able to clone this gene for the enzyme in bacterial vectors and produce it in bulk, the same way we managed to start producing human insulin in bulk for diabetic patients. The engineered recombinant factor C enzyme would also be directly activated when bound to LPS endotoxins, and scientists made a synthetic fluorogenic substrate that could be bound to the activated recombinant factor C, and this binding yields a bright fluorescent tag signaling endotoxin presence in a sample, which would allow scientists to opt for running an endotoxin test with only this protein produced from bacterial vectors, rather than bleeding any horseshoe crabs. And that's pretty cool. So if you've been vaccinated since the 1970s, and appreciate staying safe from endotoxemia, 
why not take a trip to your closest aquarium and give your gratitude to the horseshoe crab.